venerable religious and dear parishioners, St. Paul tells us very clearly about the evil of sin. And he reminds us that sin is slavery. We all know what slavery is. It's a very unpleasant word. It's a word that has historically many incredibly painful implications for so many that were slaves throughout the centuries. And what was a slave but a person who was deprived of his freedom, deprived of his God-given rights. Sometimes they were de deprived of their right to life. They were killed. They were mistreated. They didn't have freedom. And it most certainly existed in the time of St. Paul. As a matter of fact, there were times uh, in Rome where th there were more slaves than free people and brutal measures were taken to, to keep them subjugated because if they ever arose, as a matter of fact, about a hundred years before our Lord, the, the great slave leader Spartacus uh, led an uprising in Rome and they nearly, they nearly uh, conquered overthrew the power of Rome and and the Romans uh, subjugated them and it was they did terrible things to, to teach everybody a lesson every slave that survived that rebellion was crucified and they had them did it all along the Appian way just to teach everybody a lesson you do not do this so the life of a slave was a horrible thing St. Paul very well aware of this. But St. Paul is telling us that today, in today's epistle that sin is slavery. Why is that? Because the more a person commits any sin, whether it's venial or worse yet mortal, that person starts to do it more and more and more. That's slavery. You lose the freedom to say no to a forbidden pleasure. You become more and more a slave. We have a fallen human nature. It inclines downwards. It doesn't incline upwards. And as the saying goes, we are creatures of habit. So we have to sow, and I mean, I'm, I'm not in the sense of mending, but in the sense of casting seed, we have to keep sowing good deeds. As St. Augustine said hundreds of years later after this, sow an act, reap a virtue. But we can also sow bad acts. We, we then, what do we reap then? We reap vice. We reap slavery to sin. And that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is being damned to hell for all eternity. As we know, it doesn't take thousands of mortal sins to be punished in hell. It takes only one. We must dread mortal sin with every fiber of our being because the consequence of that, to die in that state, is to be deprived of heaven, deprived of the beatific vision for all eternity, and to be in the fires of hell. Not a popular thought, is it? Don't talk about that, people will say. That's unpleasant but they're doing themselves no favors. Here's the point. Those that are aware, keenly aware of the reality of hell, they're the ones that are going to avoid going there. The ones that don't want to think about it, that don't want to think about the consequences of sin, they're going to end up there. It's a necessary thought. We need to meditate on the reality of hell. People will say, how could a good and loving God send somebody to hell for all eternity? 
As a matter of fact, some people will even use this as a reason not even to believe in God. And yet here's the point. Our Lord taught it. He, our all-merciful but all-just Savior, repeatedly spoke about the everlasting fires of hell because he doesn't want us to go there. And anybody that denies it makes our Lord a liar. Also think about this. If a person could commit mortal sin and then show up after this life and say, you have to admit me to heaven, that would make an absolute mockery of God. It would mean that the sinner has triumphed over the creator. I lived the life of sin. I gave in to this gravely forbidden pleasure of whatever kind. I won. That would be the reality if a person could commit grave sin and end up in heaven anyway. Again, it would make a complete mockery of God. God is infinitely loving and merciful, but let's not forget, and this is what the world doesn't want to think about, and too many don't want to think about, he is also infinitely just. They're not exclusive of each other. They don't contradict one another. It's a mystery, true. We don't, how can you and I understand God's infinity of, of all of his infinite perfections? And let's remember this, the fires of hell are a most effective deterrent. Think about if there was no hell. Do you think the world would be better or worse than it is? It would be far, far worse because now there's no punishment, there's no consequence. And because God loves us, he does set up this very terrifying consequence not because he wants us to go there, but he wants to save us from it. And the saints and theologians will tell us even the fires of hell are not enough, if you really think about it, of a punishment. Because we have to remember, we, we have to measure the evil of sin not by how bad we feel or not feel about it. We have to measure the malice of sin by the one who is offended by it, you see. It's worse to, for example, assault a king than it would be to assault the average citizen. Both are bad. Or to assassinate a king or, you know, somebody who's the head of a country. That's worse than killing somebody else. Both are terrible murders, of course. But it's the majesty, the dignity of the person being offended that really determines the nature of that evil act, of how bad it is. I am, I am painfully reminded that, by the way, the so-called Pope Francis denies that hell exists. Or he, well, actually what he says is there is no, nobody goes to hell you're just annihilated if you die in mortal sin. And he said this repeatedly to, uh, in a couple of, inter at least two or three interviews he had with the atheist uh, re editor of La Repubblica, Antonio Scalfari. And he said, and that's how he's been quoted, and he's never retracted that and said, oh, that was a terrible mistake. No, he allows it to stand. But again, you, you're overturning the entire Catholic faith by saying, nobody goes to hell. And most of all, it denies our Lord's solemn teachings. He also denies, by the way, that our Lord ever multiplied the loaves and fishes. He repeatedly kept say, keeps saying, when, when Jesus started to distribute the bread and fishes, it made the people who had bread and fish among them start to share with each other. So just another one of his many heresies. No wonder we can't follow this, this heretic. But this is besides the point. So, yes, let us avoid a long, hot eternity. As a matter of fact, it's not just long, it's forever. 
We must do whatever it takes to persevere in the grace of God and to help save others. Remember what Our Lady of Fatima said, you know, there's so many go to hell because there's nobody to pray and sacrifice for them. We have many opportunities for sacrifice, both voluntary and, and involuntary. Think of all the things that happen that are difficult or suffering in our lives. Offer it up to help save sinners. The July 13th apparition of the, we just had that anniversary a little over a week ago. The Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia saw hell and the, and the souls flipping over eternally in the fires of hell, being tormented by the demons. A very, very sobering thought. I remind, I'm reminded also of a sermon a priest gave once. It was in a church where the air conditioner had broken down or maybe they didn't have it. It was one of those 100 degree plus days. And his sermon that day was, today is a very hot day, but there's a place that's a lot hotter. Don't go there. Persevere in the grace of God. But again, God loves us infinitely. And I want to end with this story to remind us that God wants us to get to heaven even more than we do. It's a true story. It's about a man, this was probably 40 years ago, but was struggling with a terrible addiction to drugs. And it, it, it absolutely ruined his life. He had talked about the slavery of sin. He was, he was in it. Utter downward spiral, lost everything, lost his job, lost his house, lost his, I don't know if he was married or not yet, but everything was completely went, you know, went to pieces in his life. And with his father's help, he, he, he began this, this most painful road to recovery and getting clean. And part of this was renting a motel room. And with, his, with his, his own consent, he asked his father to lock him in and to be with him. And for three days and three nights, he was in the worst withdrawal pains and sufferings. And he wanted to leave that so badly. I mean, he barely slept, he barely ate, he could barely drink anything. It was just in constant agony going through the withdrawals. He had to do it. It would have been better if he had never started down that road, but anyway, it's neither here nor there. But anyway, on the third night, he wanted so badly to, to just escape and go get his fix somehow. In the middle of the night, there he sees his father lying on the cold ground, sleeping there across the doorway so his son wouldn't be able to get out. That was an absolutely pivotal moment in his life. It was the last thing he needed to finish that recovery process, that most painful three days, three nights that he had. And it also made him realize the love of God for him, how much God wanted to save him. He saw his, his father saying, oh, son, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to help you. And here he is lying on the cold ground in the middle of the night and he realized, if that's how much my father loves me, how many millions of times more does God love me? And he had a complete turnaround. Let's remember the love of God for us. Let's return that love. Let's grow in our love for Almighty God, who loves us more than we could ever imagine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.